to start of the discussion, uh, there was a question that had come to me. Um, and that really was uh, about the differences between uh, uh, drug uh, and device evaluation. While, uh, yes, uh, there, uh, we did uh, quite a bit of discussion between uh, how the evaluation differs when you're talking about drug trials versus device trials, but are there any additional criteria to be considered when you are talking about uh, devices which are surgical implantation? So when you're uh, talking about surgically implanted devices, are there any additional criteria that we need to be cognizant of? Uh, anyone in the panel who would like to answer this question? Dr. Armstrong, maybe? So, <clears throat> Tanulji, thank you for asking the question. I think this is a critically important question. When the device being evaluated is a surgically implanted device, my background, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and I currently work for a company whose total focus is providing for children with neuromusculoskeletal needs in the pediatric and adolescent age group. When a device, a surgically implanted device is developed, we engage surgeon advisors who are experts, first of all, in the management of the condition, and secondly, with very uh, excellent experience in both the clinical and surgical management of those conditions. They're very involved in the design development of the implant itself and the instruments that will be used in the implantation of the device. And obviously, we can have some very simple ones like plates and screws, and we can have much more complicated ones like complicated uh, spinal devices. The, this is a collaboration between the engineers and the clinicians who, who know about how to use this equipment. One of the pieces that is developed is a surgical technique. And the surgical technique is very specifically developed to ensure that the use of this device is proper. And so one of the things that I believe is critically important when a company like Orthopediatrics would like to uh, enter into the ship MD he, uh, um, process is that we know that the surgeons that will be engaged in the evaluation of this particular implantable device, first of all, are, have experience in the clinical condition, and two, have extensive surgical experience, and three, will agree to follow the prescribed surgical technique. Because obviously, if you're going to evaluate a device and you've got multiple surgeons involved, you must have consistency in, to the extent that you can in, in doing the procedure so you get a fair evaluation of the device. And so that's, that's sort of my platform that I wanted to emphasize. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, anyone else in the panel have any thoughts about that, this particular question? Uh, Kolale, Vasum, uh, others? Yeah. No, I, I, I wanted to um, uh, echo what uh, Peter mentioned. It's very important consideration. Um, and again, one of the differences between device trials and drug trials is that is is that in device trials, it's not unusual uh, for the device sponsor, for the company to be present um, during certain procedures. Um, that is a big no-no in drug trials. So you cannot have, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical representative um, during your PK or PP study. Um, so that appreciation of these type of nuances and differences are very important for hospitals, for conflict of interest committees, and for IRBs. Thank you, Palale. Um, anyone else in the panel who has thoughts about this? Okay. Uh, if no, uh, then I do have uh, several questions coming in from the audience, and I'll get uh, to them one by one. 
again just as a reminder if uh, i'm unable to get to some questions because of the time we will reach out to you uh, and make sure that your questions are answered uh, one of the questions that is coming from bevel tang is that how do you imagine uh, balancing your desire to include rural community hospitals and the requirement for the hospitals to have uh, a clinical trial infrastructure already placed um, perhaps Kolale, you want to take that on? That's on, and then uh, uh, I would like, love for uh, John to add or anything that I may have missed. Um, but um, again, you know, these are recommendations for right now. Uh, it's not a rule book. Uh, these are recommendations. And um, what we hear from the audience today will inform us to come up with a set of uh, what we think could be presented as uh, kind of uh, uh, final. Uh, however, um, I strongly believe that safety should not be compromised. I think that you know the bar should not be lowered um, for um, hospital participation um, for inclusion, um, but. That's why we thought that the hub and spoke model would become very important because the hub should have a very high bar for safety and for the conduct of trials. And um, ideally, they would be in a position uh, that they could um, uh, provide certain infrastructure or at the minimum certain mentorship and coaching uh, to the hospitals that um, have access to patient population uh, that would be very well positioned uh, to be part of this hub and spoke model. Um, but I would like to really emphasize that that is not to mean that, they, that, that, that we're lowering any bars for inclusion. Thank you, Kalali. John, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I think. Uh, you know, part of the hub and spoke would be that the hubs would help train, uh, would help oversee the conduct of the trials at the other institutions. Uh, we think that it's important for rural institutions to participate in the clinical trials process. NIH has a whole uh, ECHO and IDEA uh, program where they're taking uh, hospitals and community settings that aren't used to doing research and putting a lot of money into training those institutions. Obviously, you have to have the right investigators at some of these other institutions who are competent to conduct those device trials. They have to have appropriate patient populations to be able to do that. And uh, you are correct, the questioner is correct, that not every hospital is going to have a $80,000 clinical trial management system. And so would that mean that they can't participate? I don't think so. Uh, but uh, the, do they have other ways of tracking information that the hub can then uh, receive to know where the trial is and who's been enrolled and how it's going to work? So I think as part of any application, I know for our Clinical Translational Science Award, program at Tufts, we have 40 academic partners throughout New England. Uh, and uh, that's a big part of who we are. We have rural, we have uh, urban, and others uh, to give us that kind of diversity in conducting clinical trials. Thank you, John. Uh, anyone else in the panel have any thoughts? I see uh, Dr. Rosanto from American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, do you have any thoughts about this, Dr. Rosanto? Uh, thank you. That, uh, you know, especially as somebody coming from the Midwest where a lot of our infrastructure involves rural communities. So this concept is not a new concept. We, um, we, we build capacity all the time with partner institutions outside of the main institutions. We re use requests to rely to work with them. We send clinical trial staff there to train uh, and engage them so that they can build capacity. So, so I, I believe that this hub and spoke model is a perfect mechanism to be able to do that and integrate uh, access for these these other rural community hospitals. Hey, Dr. Rosenthal, you were saying something, right? Um, first, I, I agree with 
um, each answer that the previous three um, respondents have given. You know, I, I see this as a, as a central question at helping uh, the ship construct to assure that representation of, of, um, of subjects, of pediatric subjects in, in the evaluation process um, meets all of the diversity and representation goals that we all hold to be so important. Um, and, and I, you know, the way that I, we've talked a little bit about reaching into rural communities, I, I think that that's important. I think uh, it's going to be important for the ship construct to be able to reach into urban communities uh, as well to access uh, even, you know, the neighborhood next door to some of the hub uh, uh, hospitals in, in ways that have been difficult in the past. And then in addition to reaching into the urban communities and into the rural communities, you know, reaching into some communities that have otherwise been difficult to access. Uh, so one, you know, one population that pops in into mind is is the Amish and other groups like that that are that are, um, uh, you know, that that are are you know where the Populations are our neighbors, but they, but you know, depending on the particular population, their engagement in in the evaluation of, of the, this is true for drugs too. But the evaluation of devices is, you know, is otherwise particularly di difficult. So I think the hub and spoke model is 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 a good um, is a good construct for this, and I and I do think that going forward, um, we. You know, to Kalali's point, it's going to be very important that we uh, assure uh, safety as we're um, as we're considering the, these devices, uh, particularly out in the spokes, uh, but also that the spokes are are um, far-reaching and, in, and inclusive. Uh, since uh, hospitals is you know the network of hospitals is the central tenet, the backbone of ship. Uh, I would, uh, and this is such a critical question, I would like to invite Advermed and FDA's feedback in terms of what uh, their thinking is. Uh, Tiana Kajuchi, Advermed, uh, do you have any, any thoughts about this question? Yeah, thank you, Kamoshi, for uh, inviting my thoughts. I, I just have been marveling at how well Jonathan, Jeff, Susan, and Kalala have articulated this this need uh, for a hub and spoke process. And Susan uh, and John, your comments about working, about your systems already doing this kind of approach shows that it can be effective. I mean, you're already doing this outreach uh, in your, your communities to some of these smaller facilities. And as the manager of the AdMed Clinical Trials Working Group, you know, I'm quite familiar with how challenging it is to conduct clinical trials. It's getting harder, not easier. Uh, and I think it's important to, I mean, what we're talking about doing here is building a clinical trial infrastructure for children. Um, and I think being able to, to grow that over time, grow that expertise, is going to be very, very important. So I, I think uh, our panelists, uh, and Peter Armstrong as well, have done a great job uh, articulating this concept and articulating why it's so important. So I fully endorse uh, their comments. Vasum, uh, last but not the least, uh, what are your thoughts about this? No, uh, thank you very much, Kanwajit, for uh, inviting us into the conversation. Um, I, th I, I agree with what Tara mentioned in terms of the fact that John, Kalale, Sue, and Peter have done a fantastic job really giving us the, the background and the parameters around which we need to uh, that we need to consider to really deliberate this issue well. You know, there is no doubt that we want to be inclusive. We want diversity. We want diverse populations. We want to be able to help uh, bring up and lift up uh, institutions that want to uh, engage in more of the device-related trials um, and be able to support and help their populations uh, have access to these devices. So those are those are given. 
We also need to um, balance that with some of the points, I think, um, that Kalali and John emphasized during their presentation around safety, right? We want to create a national environment for safe technology innovation for children. Um, all, all institutions may not necessarily have the same level, uh, as John mentioned, the breadth and depth of infrastructure, expertise, experience, support uh, to be able to take on uh, medical device related uh, trials, especially for novel uh, devices, especially for the class three high risk and high benefit type devices. But there certainly um, needs to be methods by which to incorporate uh, all institutions that would like to participate uh, as we consider developing that safe infrastructure. Uh, so really, I don't think there's anything significantly new here, just reemphasizing that balance and ensuring that we also think practically about being able to create a system of this nature. Right. Um, as with any early system development, uh, we need to be pra pragmatic about how we can ensure that some of the fundamental aspects uh, and the foundation is being laid in a manner that really does continue to emphasize uh, safety in these novel technology evaluations. Thank you, Basil. So I do want to clarify that, uh, and I think I think that this was made very clear in uh, the, the the panelists who spoke. Everyone supports the need for safety. So so just to echo what Fasun said, I you know there is strong support and a need for safety. No one is saying uh, anything contrary to that. Um, and and I agree, uh, Basim, that. Um, this is going to take time to build. It's not going to uh, pop up. It's not a pop-up shop. Um, it's going to take time to build. Um, and we will be pragmatic as we build it. Thanks. Right. Perfect. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I think we're all on the same page here. Uh, the desire to maintain inclusivity as well as uh, safety at the same time and the fact that uh, this is a capacity building exercise really you cannot really uh, start up with uh, like a number of hospitals so it's going to be a gradual exercise so i i agree with all of you thank you so much uh, i have a very procedural question and i think it really does tie up into the fact that uh, one of the uh, main uh, i guess uh, in, in like you know attractions of the ship md model is a central irb contract right uh, we want to make it really, really easy for all of the uh, for the innovators to actually get into the ship MD network without and basically trying to remove the red tape, so to speak. Right? Uh, there was a question from Animesh uh, Tandon. Uh, he asked that uh, yesterday in one of the presentations, Dr. Ko had said that uh, Texas Children Hospital had unpaid costs from device trials, and the central IRB contract means giving some of that control. How will hospitals be incentivized to participate in uh, in this scenario? And and that also ties up for the IRBs too. Uh, how are we going to basically make sure that IRBs agree to to give up some of the control so that uh, they enter into some sort of a reliance agreement uh, that uh, some yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you know I, I actually helped develop the smart IRB model that the CTSA program has adopted and. Um, the the questioner is correct that initially people didn't want to give up that local control uh, but when nih mandated that you can't get you can't participate in an nih sponsored clinical trial without being in a central irb mechanism quickly all the institutions weren't willing to give up all their nih dollars and so they adopted and adapted very quickly so uh, you should understand that sir, while the central IRB has oversight of the entire trial, each local IRB uh, still uh, looks at local context. So certain different states have different state laws and different state requirements. Uh, and so uh, the local IRB has to look at the local context, but they sign off and they allow uh, the central IRB to oversee the entire trial. But certainly the local IRB still has compliance issues, conflict of interest management, things of that nature that will be very, very important. 
the IRB process, it, it's not the panacea, uh, but has streamlined a lot of things because once that IRB approves the protocol and another site joins, it's easy to just say, fine, we've already approved this and we can approve this next site. Uh, if a continuing review comes in every year, uh, they only have to do that once, and it applies to all the institutions. If an amendment comes in, you don't have 20 separate IRBs or, law or more uh, debating each specific amendment. It's just one IRB. They approve it once, and it applies to all the institutions. So um, I, I really do think this would be one of the requirements of joining SHIP is we want to streamline the documentation, as you've mentioned, Kimwalchi, with having a single contracting template mechanism. We already have this with a number of the pharmaceutical companies, and it really does work. So you're not negotiating the entire contract each time. Uh, we have joint uh, confidentiality agreements and other uh, agreements. So I think uh, there's no reason for SHIP to reinvent the wheel, we would just use all those types of uh, contracting or IRB mechanisms that are already existing, that are already working, and adopt uh, and adapt it to this uh, specific mechanism. With John, I don't think we need to hyperinflate this concern because a lot of organizations have been moving in this direction. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I think this is reassuring and very helpful. Um, okay. Uh, I think I actually got a very interesting question uh, in, in email. Uh, that question, you know, I think it really ties up to some of the discussions we've had earlier this morning about how innovator can come and exit the program at any time. What about the hospitals? Can a hospital, which is a part of a ship network, exit the ship uh, network at any time? Uh, anyone in the audience has any ideas about that? No, sorry, anyone in the panelists, uh, Vasum, uh, what, what is your feeling about that? Sure, I'm um, happy to chime in with it while the others uh, collect mm -hmm. their thoughts here as well. Thanks, Kanonjit. Um, yeah, the I think we, we, we need to rec this goes back basically to the issue of developing systems, national systems, and practical aspects of developing systems, and systems that will work, that have the foundation for long-term stability um, and value. And very simply put, um, we, the intent here is with the ship FD vision is not a a case by case by case by case. That's a, a it could be a very challenging system to develop and to actually be a value to uh, the innovators in the pediatric device space. We certainly once a, once a hospital is qualified and if that hospital would like to participate and they um, are able to agree to the uh, standards and practices, uh, single contracts, IRBs, all of those pro processes that we will be putting into place that really are significantly important for the pediatric uh, device innovators, then our hope is that those institutions will be able to continue to progress and evolve with the system. Certainly, there is going to be a, a need to ensure that, number one, that the hospitals want to continue to participate, that they continue to meet the standards that the SHIP-MD organization um, has outlined. Uh, and those types of issues need, will need to be considered, especially as we get into, if we get into phase two of development. But I, I just want to make sure, and for clarity for the audience as well, that the intent here is, again, not a, a case by case issue. It's not a recruiting a hospital here, recruiting a hospital there. That type of uh, system uh, really may not work ideally for the, for what we're envisioning. And again, that, that vision, is to meet the needs of the pediatric innovators so we can actually have a sustainable platform that can actually begin to get the devices to uh, the children that need them. Thank you. I think we have any specific number of hospitals in mind. Uh, you know, that will depend on the environment as well. If relatively few people approach it, then obviously you're not going to be adding on lots of hospitals. I suspect, though, when people recognize that this is really a win-win uh, proposition, uh, that people will uh, approach this. And it could be uh, that you can do it with a, uh, <coughs> a size number of hospitals. 
the CTSA program started with five or six, and now it's 60. Uh, now, I'm not saying this would be the same way, uh, but it really depends on uh, who's approaching it, uh, what expertise specific hospitals have, and do they have the investigators uh, to conduct these trials. And as Peter mentioned before, if someone's surgically implanting an orthopedic device, you have to be sure. So you may have 10 or 12 hospitals enrolled and shipped. But Peter, your thoughts, you may only have four or five hospitals that have investigators who have the expertise to be able to implant that particular type of device. John. Uh, okay, there's uh, another question. Uh, is there basically regarding the hubs in the hub and spoke model? Uh, first one is uh, both of them are from uh, when it's Fisher actually. And first one is will hub hospitals be determining their own spoke partners? Uh, how do you envision uh, this relationship of hub to spoke uh, is going to uh, work out in practical terms? Yeah, so mm -hmm. hi, Gwen. <laughs> uh, good question. Um, so uh, that that um, was our recommendation that the hubs would reach out uh, to their networks of hospitals um, and pick the scope. But again, this is not a rule book, but this was uh, the consensus uh, from the work stream. Opportunities. Technology to reach out to a variety of different partners as part of any partnership. Um, I think now we do things locally, we do things longer distance. So I do think there's opportunities for people to reach out to, say, a Shriners Hospital uh, for orthopedic expertise, to reach out, uh, for instance, uh, most of our inpatient behavioral and psychiatric uh, illness in children uh, or maybe in an independent institution, so maybe we need to reach out to them. I think they'll decide when they put the application together for membership which hospitals seem to work, uh, which hospitals seem to fit their vision. Question uh, again from Gwen is: Will it basically envision the scenario where we are uh, there are a lot of hub hospitals applying? Will identification of hub hospitals be a competitive process, or how are we going to, you know, practically let everybody that? in? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so uh, so wait, 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 the question was answered. So let's just make sure the question was answered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Kalali, do you have any thoughts about it? I guess that you know there is an entry, uh, there is an inclusion criteria, right? So that's why our work stream works to identify, you know, what would be um, what would be the criteria that uh, would qualify hospitals for participation. And and I want to also mention that it's very important to understand that the hospitals should have skin in the game, right? So um, to conduct clinical trials is not a money-making proposition, right, for hospitals. Uh, you talk to your chief financial officer if you're working in a the hospital, they will tell you that the hospital loses money uh, by conducting clinical trials. So um, the hospitals need to have some sort of commitment to research and innovation and to serving the patient population that re require novel technologies. Uh, so those are, you know, some of the qualitative um, criteria, I would say, that you know, the hospitals should uh, take into consideration before deciding to join or not. That this was a source of debate in our, in our work stream. Uh, and I don't know that we're in agreement that we should have a significantly large number of hub hospitals. I think what we're trying to do is really um, consolidate the acquisition of knowledge and expertise so that we can continue to apply it to the innovators as they come forward and distributing these responsibilities across a very, very broad network to some extent limits our ability to do that. So I, I think we're going to have to be very thoughtful about the number of hubs we have, 
Um, there was the question, the last question had to do with the spokes and how they're identified. And I think the goal would be that they're not identified, as Stu has said, on an ad hoc basis, but they're identified based on additional capacity that a hospital would need, um, or they could be filled by, by the, a spoke hospital. Um, to supplement what they're capable of doing. But I, I, I really want to caution us to consider the fact that, that maintaining a relatively tight network allows us to really understand and, and move through the process, be nimble, transfer that education that we pull in um, across our stakeholders. I think there's there's good support for having a very efficient network, but the fact remains that you need to be able through this network to provide the necessary patient volume and 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 investigator expertise to be able to successfully do the evaluation. And so there's there's that side to the equation as well as just well, what hospitals can apply and so on. We've, we've got to determine that the network we have can do the work that we have for them to do. The important as part of a number of our studies that we do as part of the CTSA program, we are constantly doing cohort discovery um, and we're doing it every day where we're a, a drug sponsor or a device sponsor comes to us and says, well, I need uh, these patients, and we are able to then go back through our electronic health record data, find out how many patients met those criteria or had those diagnoses or who would have been eligible to participate in the trial over the last three or four years, and then give them those numbers. So, so I agree with you, with both Peter and, and Sue, that, you know, we don't have a specific number. We just know that we need to have enough patients, and if you're dealing with rare diseases, um, you know, uh, Pedro presented the pediatric heart valve and says, you know, not not every child is going to need this. Uh, so if you need an X number of patients with this particular condition that's going to need this particular valve, uh, you may not be able to get it in two or three centers. You may need to reach out to more. So I think all of these things are a matter of discussion, and I know Bessum, you and I and others have had a lot of discussion, you know, where's the sweet spot? You know, how many is enough, and how many, as Sue brings up, is too much that you lose some control of that network? Mm -hmm. Anyone else in the panel have any thoughts about that? Um, my, I'm sorry, Colonel G. My, my only thought regarding this, the um, discussion that's happening right now is that I think that um, there, there needs to be uh, sort of baked into the uh, ship um, concept the, uh, enough, um, enough rigidity to assure safety and enough flexibility to assure inclusion. It, it may be that, uh, it may be that the um, um, investigator that develops a device that is very, you know, relevant is, uh, you know, works in a hospital that's neither a hub nor a spoke hospital, uh, and, or maybe that, or maybe that the identified hub and spoke hospitals ha have a low prevalence of the um, disease that requires the device, but some other setting has a has a high proportion. Um, reference was made earlier to the to the uh, otitis media uh, detection devices as an example of how um, the 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 settings may need to be um, uh, ex, you know expanded. I think the hub and spoke con concept um, it need, needs to be flexible enough so that it can be adapted if a particular um, instance requires that in order to meet the safety and inclusion criteria. I perfectly agree with you, uh, Dr. Rosanthal. It has to have both of those elements, uh, rigidity as well as flexibility, just that right sweet spot. That's where basically we want to be when we get to how many hospitals do, do we want to enroll. Even, even though we uh, certainly aren't mandating and making X number of hospitals at this stage, but, you know, 
I think your point is very well taken. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, I have a few more questions coming in uh, about uh, uh, the ability of uh, Hub or Spoke to, to stay. So basically there's a question from Jacqueline Phillips. Uh, she asked, she's asking, uh, she, will a, a Hub or Spoke hospital be able to recuse themselves from the city? If for example, they're already creating a competitive product in the same space as uh, the ship MD innovator. I mean, this probably uh, does happen uh, quite often if you're talking about large uh, hospitals when they're undertaking more than one uh, trial at, at, at a given time. How is this going to work out in a ship MD scenario? Out this at length, and there, there has to be a robust conflict of interest um, strategy in place within ship MD to ensure that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hospital will have ability to uh, not participate in, in any given study if they're already doing another study with a competitor. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I assume I sorry, didn't mean to talk. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Well, you know, the point I was going to make is, you know, a, a related question is what if, what if there are what are, what if there are two competing devices that are that are each viable devices mm -hmm. and, and each approach the, and each uh, you know, try to um, uh, board the ship, um, you know, and, you know, embark on the, in, within the ship model um, is, you know, I think, um, you know, at some point we'll need, you know, we will need to give some thought as to how to, how to handle those kinds of situations. Um, it, it's going to, you know, I can imagine that might be kind of uh, dicey from the perspective of the developers of those um, uh, competing devices to, to both rely on an infrastructure that um, where there might be some commonalities among um, among elements of the infrastructure. But um, anyway, something to think about. I, I don't have an answer for that one, but I can imagine that might come up as well. Yeah, and if, uh, just to add in, add on there, um, <laughs> I've got to, I've got to thank Jackie for uh, bringing up questions that not not only are very thoughtful and important, but also <laughs> reflect, um, I think, uh, what we all want. We all want to be at the point where we're having to make these decisions, right? Where ship is actually working. Uh, people are interested in developing these devices. They're interested in engaging in the ship system. They see that it makes a difference. They see that it makes a benefit. They want to make sure that these devices get out to children. And if we are there and we're trying to figure out, well, we've got, you know, two of the same devices or three of the same devices, and we want to figure out which one's going to benefit best from ship, that's a great situation to be in, number one. And we had a little bit of this conversation uh, during the Navigation Works uh, session uh, as well. And I think, you know, there are a number of ways to look at it, uh, just like Jeff uh, was suggesting. There's no perfect answer. Um, I, you know, simple, simple ways to think about it is, let's say we have, you know, 10 uh, hospitals in the ship system that are qualified and that can uh, help uh, accommodate that type of a, a trial. Maybe five take on one of the uh, devices and five take on the other. That's a very simplified way of looking at it. But as just just to kind of give people a very practical sense of how this works out. Now I'm going to give you a more complex way of how it could work out. You know, we're thinking about um, how do we really engage the adaptive trials platform uh, principles uh, to really create a system like that that's dynamic for evidence generation within the pediatric device space. There isn't uh, such an example, and that, that doesn't exist currently. Some of that has been done in the drug space, in the pediatric drug space, but again, just like Kalali and John pointed out earlier, there are fundamental differences between what's necessary to be able to conduct trials on the drug side, pediatric drugs, versus the device side, pediatric devices. And we need to be cognizant of that. But again, if we're able to create an adaptive trials uh, process that could fit into the uh, SHIP system, that would be a, a great way to be able to accommodate um, uh, competing interests of specific devices that may be intended to assist a similar patient population or a similar pathophysiology. So those types of topics certainly need to be thought through, just like Jeff is 
mentioning. There's no perfect answer. I think Kalali put it best by saying, you know, this is not a rule book. Uh, these are recommendations and thoughtful considerations that um, the hospital work stream and the coordinating committee and EC have gone through for quite some time. And we really appreciate the feedback and the thoughts uh, that all of you are engendering during this conversation. And that will definitely factor in as we uh, figure out how to make the system work appropriately. And I think, well, gee, that that kind of feedback and the person is 100% correct. You know, we'll, we'll get that from all the key stakeholders as we set this process up. This is really a dynamic process, and I don't know, if we know all the answers yet. But boy, what a, a perfect opportunity if you get two devices at the same time, as SM says. Maybe uh, half the hospitals use one device, half the hospitals use another. Maybe one device is used first with the other device ready with IRB approval. And as soon as the last patient is finished in one trial, the new trial starts and the next patient that comes through gets the second device. Maybe it's even uh, that, you know, uh, this patient uh, gets the one device and the next patient that comes through gets the second device. Um, would sponsors be comfortable with that? I don't know. Uh, could you even do a comparison trial? If you have two or three devices, could you have different arms? Will they have the same exact uh, inclusion criteria? I mean, there's lots of questions, and we're really hoping this coordinating center that we set up uh, with really a tremendous amount of expertise will be able to help us, uh, and that'll be the benefit for the sponsors, is you'll get that kind of trial design with people uh, who are really highly qualified to help them and it may be, as Vasum suggests, that if you can use an adaptive trial design instead of 50 patients, maybe only 20 are necessary. Mm -hmm. And boy, you've just saved a lot of time, energy, effort, and money, uh, and you've got your trial done successfully. Yep. And I just want to reemphasize what Sue mentioned uh, a while back, and I know John and Kalala had mentioned as well, uh, COI. There's going to be a coordinating group. We're going to uh, work through those COI issues. But um, I think it's fantastic that, that we'll even need to get to that point of this uh, nuanced discussion that we're having. You know, we're certainly far in front of that, uh, but we need to be prepared for it as well. So uh, the coordination and the COI issues, just like, uh, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, as has been noted, but uh, we will have to have some parameters in place. Mm -hmm. I yeah, okay. wanted to also add that, you know, that, that question sparked a, a very interesting, actually, thought, you know, that uh, devices, specifically pediatric device trials, should uh, take advantage of uh, novel uh, biostatistics models, such as adaptive trials and Bayesian models. So that's a whole other workshop, I guess, that should be um, organized yeah. around that. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So this is just a very quick time check. We have one minute left uh, in the session, and I will only be able to get to one more question. As I'm reiterating again, some of the questions that were not answered, we will get back to you. And that quick question that I'll get in is, will this uh, hub and spoke model inside the ship system apply to post-marketing surveillance clinical trials? You know, as we are talking about, uh, they certainly will be applying to the pre-approval trials, yes. But what about the post-marketing uh, surveillance trials? Any thoughts about that? Short answer, yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. And uh, with that, uh, we uh, do come to an end to this session. I do hope uh, for everyone in the audience, this was uh, informative and a productive uh, discussion.